This is On Target with Penny Wolfgang, a program that takes an inside look at what is happening in Western New York with news, features, and special guests. Now, here's your host, Penny Wolfgang. Hello, and welcome to On Target, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm your host, Penny Wolfgang, and it's my pleasure to be with you every week. And at times, we try to talk about subjects that we think are educational, and sometimes it's about health, sometimes it's interesting, sometimes it's entertaining, but uh, we try our best to keep you tuning into us every week, so we hope you will. And of course, every su- every program and every subject and every week, we are really concentrating on Western New York, on people that are making things happen, on places, on events, on culture, anything that we feel you would be interested in learning more about because we're so dedicated to this area and to the people in Western New York. And everyone always says, what's so wonderful about being in Western New York? They always complain about the weather or our teams, although... I shouldn't say that now. I don't want to. I don't want to be negative when it's a good time. However, you know the the football team, or if it doesn't win, or the Sabres, this or that. However, everybody always wants to be here. Always wants to come back. Is always dedicated to being in Western New York. And when they ask them why, they always say it's the people. So we're trying on on target to talk to some of these people and tell you what they're doing and what impact they're having. And the other day I was reading, well, actually it was a little more than the other day, a story in um, the news about a gentleman who was a student at Damon and launched a festival about the joy of puppetry. And there was a picture of him, Cameron Garrity, holding Scrap, a puppet that he created from a scrap of fabric that was given to him by his mentor, the late great that we are all familiar with, probably the most well-known puppeteer in the whole world, Jim Menke. And uh, there was this picture, and the joy of puppetry seemed to me, well, such an unusual subject and such an unusual what turns out to be actually a career that I read a little further and found out that this is a gentleman we really need to meet here on On Target. So here he is, and I'm going to introduce him to you with fanfare, uh, (laughs) our guest, uh, Cameron Garrity. And Mr. Garrity is what is known as a graphic designer and, of course, as I said already, a puppeteer. He was born and raised in right here in Buffalo, New York. And as I already mentioned, he graduated. I don't know if I said he graduated, but when the story was written, he was associated with Damon College. I'm not sure if he had graduated yet, but we'll let him tell his, his own story about that because I know the secret, which is, yes, he did graduate. <laughs> and uh, he was a very, became very interested in this while he was at college and has done some fascinating things. Um, interesting things about puppets and has made them something that we can talk about in many ways, both educationally and both career-wise. So I I think it's unusual. And thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited that we got to meet you in real life. Oh, thank you so much for having me Because you're famous. I guess you realize that once you have a big picture in the newspaper. Well, that's that's very flattering. I'm not sure <laughs> and famous is the word. Well, I not only, I, I guess I should say, not only is um, Cameron Garrity here, but so is Scrap. Yes. But I found out Scrap was not going to talk to us. My gosh, she's He's, buried under this. I'm, I'm doing fine. Don't tell them I'm buried. That's okay. <laughs> it's the magic of radio. We're creating word pictures. Oh, good, good. Um, Scrap. Yes. <laughs> How did you come to be? You look a lot like... The famous, um, what's the famous green puppet? That well, there, there's knows. Kermit the Frog. You look like Kermit. You look like a messier Kermit. I'm a, I'm a little different than than Kermit, uh, your your honor. I I am a monster. <laughs> I am a monster. I have four eyes. Kermit has two, and uh, I'm hairy. And um, even though it's not so easy, I I am green, and I I'm I'm dealing with that. <laughs> you know. It's uh, not easy to be green, as we all know. When we, going back, I think probably in everyone's mind, if you say puppets or you say puppet shows, there's no doubt that Sesame Street just comes to, it is part of everyone's childhood, I think, who is listening. Goes all the way back to generations, right? I I would think so, and I'm going to turn that one over to Cameron because he could talk a little bit more more about that. Yes, Um, Cameron would know. (laughs) Yeah, uh, well, what's what's interesting about Sesame Street and about the Muppets is that they are something that when you when you say puppet, 
you know, it's sort of the elephant in the room or maybe the, the snuffleupagus in the room that um, you, you instantly start to think of the creations of Jim Henson and Frank Oz. Um, but what's, what's really great about them is that so much of what made the Muppets successful is what made puppetry that came before the Muppets successful. And they're sort of just the next part of a very long lineage of successful puppet performers or, or puppeteers as we call them. And um, the Muppets just had the benefit of being in 120 countries in five different languages and always in prime time. Um, but it, it is something that, that is very much ubiquitous and it's something that we try hard to both emulate and also distance ourselves so that we could create uh, a name for ourselves as puppeteers. So you mentioned, and I think it's like interesting to bring up and talk about, that there was puppetry and it was well known, and it was a form of art going way back, correct? It is an to art when form. And, yeah, it, to, it's an art form almost as old as storytelling itself, really. For as long as we've had people telling stories, they've been using props or, or puppets to, to help illustrate their stories and, and bring them to life. Um, the, the definition that I like to use of puppetry is bringing life to an inanimate object uh, not inherent to its own mechanism, which sounds really, you know, high flouten and academic, but but what that really means is moving an object in a way it can't normally move. So even if you were to pick up a pen that you're holding, um, you put it on the table, it's just going to lie there flat. But once you start moving it and making it dance, it's becoming your puppet. Now, obviously, we have tools that look like Scrap or that look like Kermit or Big Bird or Ernie or, or any of those characters, and we would call those puppets, but I'd argue that even this cup of water here could become a puppet if you um, artfully uh, move it around uh, the, in the right way. What were some of the famous, before the Muppets, some of the famous puppet, uh, there was the one who was uh, the, fam the famous father of the movie star. That goes oh, there yeah. was there was Edgar Bergen, right? Uh, and he right. his he was a, That's a who ventriloquist I'm of. Mm -hmm. um, whose puppet was uh, his main character was Charlie McCarthy, um, and he was of course father to to Candace Bergen. Um, but before, well, I don't I don't know if it was before at the same time, but there was also um, Bert Hilstrom who created Kukla Fran and Ollie, which was really one of the first um, one of the first sets of puppets for for television. And what was interesting about that is that they took the proscenium, you know, that small little stage with the window box, and, and just started filming that. Uh, and when Jim Henson came onto the scene in the, the mid-1950s, he realized that the television was the new proscenium. He realized that that box was defined not by the box that you filmed on, on the screen, but by the television itself. And that is what sort of began the um, the iconic Muppet style that a lot of people, including myself, uh, tend to emulate nowadays. Now, when you were a little kid, were you motivated to do this by, are you going back to Sesame Street or back further to these people? Or was it something else when, when you were home and you w were thinking, this is something I would be interested in doing, <laughs> uh, while the other kids were playing football or whatever? Well, yeah, and you know what? It, puppetry is something that I've wanted to do before I even knew that it was a thing that people could do. Um, I've been watching, you know, I practically was in the womb singing Sunny Days, um, you know, the, the theme song to Sesame Street. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's something that I've always been interested in. Uh, it, it, from the, you know, ripe old age of, of even three years old, I had documentaries where I would watch Jim Henson and Frank Oz and those, those geniuses create the Muppet productions that they did as well as the Dark Crystal and the Labyrinth and all these very elaborate projects. And I would mirror their their manipulation styles as I was watching them on television. So I was putting my arm up in the air. I was I was lip syncing the way that Jim would do Kermit. I would even, um, you know, put my face into a, a pose that he would do. You know, he kind of when he performed Kermit, he'd look down and he had this concentrated frown um, that he would do. And um, you know that that was just that I I copied his entire his body language uh, in doing that. So you started out young, very young, and yes. then did you? Then how did it progress? Did you do this as a hobby? Did you make your own puppets? Did you what? You know, it what was, happened? It was always a hobby. I was fortunate enough to um, my my parents were always buying me puppet toys that you would get at you know a local business like Clayton's or um, you know sometimes Toys R Us if we were lucky, but um, Clayton's it was usually the go to, and. Um, I, I didn't build a lot of puppets as a kid. I, I did it sometimes. And um, it was always something, though, if I had an oral presentation at school, 
if I was doing any kind of, you know, little show at home or whatever, puppets were always coming out to, to help me and aid me in the, in the presentation. And then it was once I got to high school and my hands started growing out of the, the, the store-bought puppets that I experimented a little bit with, with building my own construction. And um, once YouTube came into the scene, um, I was able to start sort of publishing my work and having other people see it. Now, you, when you went to college, you, did you continue on with this? or have you a- And you've added on different, I don't know, degrees or disciplines that are related to puppetry. Yeah, the the really wonderful thing that happened in college was that I started finding um, teachers, professors who um, were were skilled enough that they were able to help me and aid me in studying the art of puppetry. I always had support from my teachers, um, both at, at St. John the Baptist at, as in elementary school and then at Canisius High School where I graduated, graduated high school. Um, but once I got to Damon and was in a theater program and met people like uh, Chris Brangis and Bob Waterhouse, were they able to really point me in the right direction of where I could go? And at the, in the case of Damon, the place that I was directed to was the student faculty interdisciplinary think tank program, uh, which is a you know very nice long name. But what that program does is allow for students um, to receive grant money so that they could study their interests, their academic interests, outside of the school. Um, some students use it in the sciences to um, buy things so that they could do their own research projects. I took advantage of it to study at the National Puppetry Conference at the Eugene O'Neill Theater Center, where I was working alongside of some of the countries, some of the world's most talented puppeteers, people like, um, excuse me, like Jim Rose, whose parents created the first Howdy Doody puppet, like Philip Huber, who uh, created puppets for Being John Malkovich, and more recently, uh, the China Doll and the Wizard of Oz movie. Um, but also learning from some people who I watched as a child, like Pam Marciero and Mar- Martin Robinson, who respectively um, perform Grunge Out of the Grouch and Mr. Snuffleupagus on Sesame Street. I don't, I think I was confusing Jim, the famous. Uh, ah, Jim Henson. Henson with Jim Menke. Jim Menke. Now tell me about Jim Menke. He's a local puppeteer. Jim Menke yeah. was, was a local puppeteer, um, someone who's very close with, with my family. Uh, he, um, he passed away a number of years ago. Um, he was a, a local puppeteer, as I said, worked at um, Fantasy Island. He was one of the people who wrote all the, the shootout shows back, back in the days before it was Martin's Fantasy Island. Um, and he, he did a lot of puppet shows for, for some of the um, theaters that, that were at Martin's Fantasy or that were at Fantasy Island. Uh, he also he worked with Jim Henson um, back in the 50s um, in some of those puppeteers. He knew a lot of that old guard. Uh, and then later in life, he did shows for local businesses and birthday parties and things like that. I knew him from St. John the Baptist Parish, where we, uh, we were Eucharistic ministers every week. We, we would talk after... Um, after mass, and it was sort of after a couple of years that we we both realized that we had this interest in puppetry, um, that we were both puppeteers, that we both were interested in the Muppet style, and it was it was only about a month before he passed <coughs> away, uh, where he gave me a box of, of fabric um, that had this beautiful piece of, of green fur, mm-hmm. and I said, oh boy, I'm gonna have to do something with this. It was it was too great, and then. As I said, he was he passed away very shortly after that, and um, that's why Scrap's full name is James M. Scrapladder, um, which is you know James Mankey um, in in honor of him. So Scrap, are you happy with your green with your color? Do you like oh, your color? Oh, it's wonderful! <laughs> yes. Oh, it's so terrific. It keeps me warm in the winter, and and unfortunately a little warm in the summer. But but that's why I live in Buffalo. <laughs> yes, you need that covering. Oh, sure. I think there um, are other other disciplines or fields that are involved that you have to learn in o- along with puppetry like um, you're mentioning well I, I don't I can't say sewing I can't think of the way but putting it together has to do sure. with something and then creating the character there might be music there's a there seems to be a lot more than just um, manipulating a puppet absolutely and um, what I like to say is that puppetry is sort of this all-inclusive art form and, and as you said there's the design of the character there's the construction um, there is sewing. Definitely had to teach myself how to right sew a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, and then there's there's certain kinds of musical composition that works r- specifically for puppetry. Certain styles of writing that work specifically for puppetry. 
Um, and that's why, while the word puppeteer is great, I actually prefer using puppet artist um, because you're doing all these different disciplines. And some people have their strengths. Um, you know, Scrap recently, um, and Scrap put cover your ears, but uh, was just recently reconstructed by a good friend of mine, Ow! Um, Ow! Adam Adam Krutinger. Um, Adam Krutinger, who's a terrific puppet builder. You know, he he were he, and he's local. Uh, he he constructs puppets just as fine as you'd see on Sesame Street or The Muppet Show. Um, and you know that that's his strength. And he also puppeteers, but he's a terrific builder. Um, I do a lot of performance and such, but I'm also a writer and a storyboard artist, which helps with a lot of the composition of our of our work. And then um, another friend of ours, Zach Halmaser, has is sort of like me that he's been doing puppet stuff since you know before he could walk. And uh, he has, as I do, this encyclopedic brain for for Muppet trivia. And um, he's a great voice voice person. He could do, you know, the whole Looney Tunes cast practically. Mm-hmm. He's, he's terrific. And uh, the three of us, you know, are these, we have separate branches of this, you know, puppetry artist um, umbrella, and uh, it, it works really well for us. In case you just tuned in today, you are listening to On Target with your host, Penny Wolfgang. And my guests today are um, Cameron Garrity and Scrap. Of course. And they, they are. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, no. Oh, no, we're not interrupting. <laughs> uh, and so we are talking about the art of puppetry, and we are talking to a local person who has uh, been successful in that and who has been. Uh, I think in a, a good example of a s- person in Western New York who has made a name for himself outside of the area and is continuing to do so. And we're going to be looking for great things in the future. I, I was realizing when you said about the storyboard that not only are all these different, as we said, um, talents needed to get the puppetry, uh, to put it together and to make it, but the stories can be, and we're using the Muppets and Sesame Street, can be instructive and um, affirmative and useful. It can be in many ways, right? For yes. children, for young young children as lessons. Absolutely, um, and that's that's something that Sesame Street has done very well. Create, uh, <laughs> you know, combining education and entertainment at, at the same time, and um, that's something that I've personally, in the last uh, year or so, have really been working towards with my puppetry um, and working on. I'm currently in development on a show um, where I take some of my experiences as a patient and as a volunteer in some local hospitals and helping student, uh, helping patients cope and understand um, the, the oftentimes scary and confusing world of a hospital um, and specifically targeting um, you know, young, excuse me, teenagers and young adults who are in a weird limbo between um, not quite old enough yet for an adult hospital, but who've completely grown out of the aesthetic of a children's hospital and really trying to, to target them. And that's something that, um, as I said, I'm, I'm been really excited and, and working on. Well, one of the, when you mentioned patients, um, mm-hmm. I read that one of the motivating factors for you to get involved with puppetry was when you were suffering from a disease as a young person and couldn't um, actually perform like physical activities or sports. What was that? And, you know, is that the experience that you're, that you're relying sure. on? It, it is a part of the experience that I'm, I'm referring to. I was never a particularly athletic kid, but uh, about 10 years ago, I, I fell rather ill. I was in seventh grade and um, we've, we've since over the years learned that this, this disease is actually called mitochondrial disease. Um, which, uh, you know, sounds, again, somewhat intimidating. And if, if you could think back to um, freshman year biology class, when you learn about the mm-hmm. parts of the cell, we learn that um, the mitochondrial is the, the, excuse me, the mitochondria are the part of the cell that makes um, good energy by the process of ATP. Uh, now, for patients who have mitochondrial disease, for, for people who have mitochondrial disease, their mitochondria do not make um, ATP, but rather ammonia and lactic acid, which poisons the system. Now, in my case, uh, it has affected my, my, my sinus system as well as my gastrointestinal um, tract and my, my, my gut, basically, uh, to use the layman's term. And, and it's a pro- progressive illness that sort of it, it tries to break out to, towards your entire body. And that... Uh, caused me to miss a lot of school 
especially in seventh and eighth grade, but even throughout high school and some of college. And, um, you know, a lot of my time was spent just sitting on the couch and um, studying Muppet documentaries or animation documentaries, sewing sewing puppets, um, you know, thinking of what the next project would be when I was feeling well and healthy. Uh, it was something very therapeutic to be able to to watch and to absorb. So this is how something good can, can always come can Absolutely. be made out of something Absolutely. bad. Absolutely. As I said, I've spent a lot of time in the hospitals and and now as I'm, you know, becoming older and, and sort of looking back on, as I said, 10 years, a fairly long history of, of struggling, I'd like to be able to channel that because I know I'm not alone in the struggle. I know there are a lot of other children and young adults who, who have similar issues and, um, you know, trying to be a source of knowledge and, and support for them. So you have been speaking in various places aside from on target. Yes. <laughs> and one is some. You know, I'm supposed to know what TED X is. TED is a is an acronym, and TED is a, a lecture series that's held all throughout the country, all throughout the world, where artists and performers will speak about um, their their knowledge base, what what they're passionate about, and then local cities will host their own TED X conferences. So in two weeks, um, two weeks to the day we're recording this, uh, October fifteenth, that's a Tuesday. Um, we will, excuse me, Buffalo will be hosting their third annual TEDx Buffalo conference, and I'll be speaking about the uh, the power of puppetry uh, when I'm there. And the history, uh, fictional characters, which yes. I think is fascinating. Thank you. Uh, well, what's interesting about puppetry, and, and part of what uh, has, has continues to draw me in, is that um, but puppets... In, in my estimation, you know, my humble, unobjective, excuse me, um, unbiased opinion as a puppeteer, um, puppets make the most successful fictional characters in all of history. Um, and, and the reason being is that they exist in our real space. If I was to, um, to ask Scrap to come out right now, um, he, would, he would sit in the chair and he would look and, and speak with you. And at, at the end of that conversation, um, he would be more than willing to, to either shake your hand or, or give you a hug. Um, and that, that's true for any puppet character versus maybe an animated character. Um, who, if you were to, to speak with them, and I'm using air quotes right now, um, mm. you, you'd be probably talking to a tennis ball. So you know where to, oh. to focus your eyes. And then animators would go and work for a month or two on animating that character into the scene. Um, and then even you know more so, um, if you had someone like um, Ben Affleck, who's going to be performing uh, Batman in a couple months, if he was to come on your show, he's not going to show up as Batman. He's going to show up as Ben Affleck. And um, that's what's really interesting to me about puppets is that they exist in the real world where you don't see that with hardly any other um, fictional characters. Sasha Baron Cohen, who's famous for Borat, might be one of the few exceptions. Maybe Peter Sellers, too. Mm. You I didn't tell you, but I didn't want you to tell everyone about Ben Affleck. Now, you told all our listeners you gave it away. I was trying to keep oh, it secret. Oh, no. I'm so you sorry. But you keep... idiot. You screwed it up. If I'm I'm, so, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Please, <gasps> please forgive him. If they tune Don't in. Don't send him to jail. He needs to give a TED Talk. Okay, I won't, but... I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll go back on to my the other hand, On the other hand, I'm hoping everyone this way, people will just keep listening, you know, because oh, sh- within the next couple sure, of weeks, sure. oh, <laughs> Ben Affleck is coming. Ben Wonderful. Affleck is coming, you know. What a show. Um, also, um, I did want to say, I did want you to say and get credit for having organized the Geppetto Festival. Yes. Which happened already, but I think it's going to happen again in the future. It will. Yeah. The, the Geppetto Festival was uh, my senior capstone project while I was at Damon College. And, and the mission of that was to bring a new life to puppetry, both in Buffalo and, and throughout, hopefully, uh, the country. And I was able to bring over... Um, 12 puppeteers to Buffalo to perform, to give lectures. It was sort of a, a TEDx puppetry in a lot of ways. And um, even though I just did that as a student, you know, getting class credit, it was such a success that we'll be bringing it back to Damon. Uh, and I know August. that that we didn't talk about famous, when we talk about famous puppets, we left Geppetto out. Of, of or, course, well, of, Pinocchio. Of yes. Pinocchio fame, yes. right. So um, that's something that probably all our listeners go back in their childhood There's and some, think about, There's some great too, iconography right? there, so, yeah. definitely. Well, it was really nice talking to you. It was a pleasure talking to you. Oh. We're going to be looking uh, to hear more about you, and everyone's going to be saying, oh, we 
what we remember when he was on on Target and, <laughs> and they talked to him and told us about Geppetto and and Scrap. Of course, um, you can't forget Scrap. No, we won't. So thanks a lot. It was really uh, good meeting you, oh, and thank we you so much. hope our listeners enjoyed our conversation too. So we'll look for you again next week. We may or may not have Ben Affleck, but hopefully <laughs> we'll have somebody just as famous and just as interesting here on on Target. So have a really good week and goodbye, everyone. You've been listening to On Target with Penny Wolfgang, a program that takes an inside look at Western New York and our community. If you have any comments or suggestions, please write to Penny Wolfgang at 500 Corporate Parkway, Suite 200, Amherst, New York, 14226.